Hi everyone, the topic that we want to talk about today is retroperitoneal hematoma. So today's discussion is going to be on retroperitoneal hematoma. First, let's define what retroperitoneal hematoma is all about. Retroperitoneal hematoma means that bleeding is happening in the retroperitoneal space. Bleeding can be due to any source. It can be traumatic or it can be spontaneous. It can be iatrogenic. Bleeding from any particular source into the retroperitoneal space is defined as retroperitoneal hematoma. We must understand that this bleeding which happens in the retroperitoneal space can be either an occult bleeding or can be significant bleeding. If it is an occult bleeding means this bleeding cannot be diagnosed clinically. The amount of bleeding is so small that it is not significant enough to cause symptoms and signs. But if there is a significant bleeding it often produces something called as hemorrhagic shock which ultimately gives rise to signs and symptoms of shock that is tachycardia and uh, hyperventilation and also uh, tachypnea along with hypovolemia all right so this bleeding of retroperitoneal hematoma is divided into two different types which can happen one is occult bleeding and the other one is significant bleeding Occult bleeding often go unrecognized. This leads to significant mortality or morbidity. In case of significant bleeding, patient usually presents with signs and symptoms which ultimately gives rise to hemorrhagic shock, it gives rise to hemorrhagic shock which is obviously tachycardia, tachypnea and other stuff. And this hemorrhagic shock is obviously due to the underlying retroperitoneal hematoma. Okay, so this underlying retroperitoneal hematoma, which is significant in size, has given rise to hemorrhagic shock. Before we try to understand the details of retroperitoneal hematoma, we must first understand what retroperitoneal space is. Retroperitoneal space is basically that space which lies just posterior to the peritoneum. Alright, so there are intraperitoneal organs which are enclosed within the peritoneum and posterior to the peritoneum lies the retroperitoneal space. Okay, so we will try to understand what retroperitoneal space is all about. We will first draw the abdomen. This is the abdominal cavity. Within the abdominal cavity, obviously, there is a peritoneum. So, we will draw the peritoneum now. This is the peritoneum. And within the peritoneum or peritoneal cavity is, are the interperitoneal organs. And posterior to this peritoneum, the highlighted part is retroperitoneum. This is the retroperitoneum. So, any bleeding in this particular space will give rise to retroperitoneal hematoma. Therefore, retroperitoneum lies posterior to the peritoneum. And any bleeding in this retroperitoneal space will give rise to retroperitoneal hematoma. This retroperitoneum can be divided into various zones. These zones are important to localize where the bleeding is and will 
help us in managing the situation because the management will differ based on in which zone the bleeding has occurred or in which zone the hematoma is actually present so the retroperitoneum is divided into various zones all right retroperitoneum is divided into various zones so to understand this zones we are going to draw a sketch of an abdomen and we are going to look at the retroperitoneal area but at first we will draw the psoas muscle there is one psoas on the right the other psoas muscle is on the left so we are marking the psoas muscle over here okay so these are the psoas muscle the region in between the two psoas muscle in the midline is called zone 1 or the central zone all right so between the two psoas muscle this particular zone which is being drawn over here is called as zone 1 which is called as a central zone a very important zone because most of the midline structures like abdominal aorta ivc pancreas and duodenum are present okay so zone 1 is also called as central zone because most of the midline structures are present in the central zone these are abdominal aorta inferior vena cava pancreas and duodenum now let us look at the zone which is lateral to the psoas muscle on both sides those are lateral zone or the perirenal zones okay so the zone which is lateral to the psoas muscle is called as the lateral zone or the perirenal zone which is lateral to the psoas muscle so zone 2 is also called as perirenal zone it is present lateral to psoas muscle it contains structures like kidney ureter and portions of colon the last zone that we want to talk about is the pelvic zone it is also called as zone 3 it's actually the zone of the retroperitoneum below the bifurcation of aorta so this is zone 3 also called as pelvic zone present below the bifurcation of aorta lot of vessels are present bladder is present so the pelvic zone is called zone 3 it contains structures like bladder and other vascular structures vascular structures based on uh, the etiology retroperitoneal hematoma can be divided into two types one is traumatic the other one is non-traumatic traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma can happen because of penetrating trauma or it can happen because of non-penetrating trauma and non-traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma occurs either due to spontaneous reasons or due to iatrogenic reasons all right so retroperitoneal hematoma hematoma if you look at the etiology based on the etiology of ret retroperitoneal hematoma it can be divided into two types the first is traumatic and the other is non-traumatic 
Traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma can be further divided into penetrating or non-penetrating which is also called as blunt trauma okay non-penetrating also called as blunt trauma non-traumatic non retroperitoneal hematoma can be divided into spontaneous or it can be atrogenic as we discussed before that traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma can happen due to blunt injury or penetrating injury all right so traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma can happen due to blunt injury can happen due to blunt injury or penetrating injury or penetrating injury majority of these are due to blunt trauma okay so majority of these are due to blunt trauma whenever blunt trauma occurs whenever blunt trauma occurs it gives rise to compressive and decelerating forces okay it gives rise to compressive and decelerating forces and these forces are actually acting on the tissues so compressive and decelerating forces are actually acting on the tissues so it causes crushing and shearing of the tissues it causes crushing and shearing of the tissues and also vascular structures and also vascular structures which will eventually cause the retroperitoneal hematoma when we talk about penetrating injury there are two different kinds one is gunshot the other one is stab one is gunshot wound the other one is stab wound whenever these injuries are present whenever these injuries are present we must make sure that we have ruled out other intraperitoneal organ injury because whenever these injuries are present they are often associated with they are often associated with injuries to intraperitoneal organs these are often associated with injuries to intraperitoneal organs when we talk about non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma they can either be atrogenic or can be spontaneous so non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma occurs due to iatrogenic cause or spontaneous cause iatrogenic means we are doing certain procedures which is going to cause retroperitoneal hematoma and those procedures can be like percutaneous interventions or certain endovascular procedures and spontaneous retroperitoneal hematomas are seen in patients who have underlying coagulopathy or patients who are on regular warfarin right so non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma is either due to is either due to iatrogenic cause is either due to iatrogenic 
cause or due to spontaneous cause when we talk about iatrogenic causes they can be causes like percutaneous intervention percutaneous intervention or endovascular procedures or endovascular procedures these are causes of iatrogenic retroperitoneal hematoma there are certain risk factors which are associated with this iatrogenic cause of non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma those risk factors are arterial puncture above the level of inguinal ligament arterial puncture above the level of above the level of inguinal ligament inguinal ligament female sex treatment with gp2b 3a inhibitors treatment with gp2b 3a inhibitors and patients who are on treatment with warfarin patients who are on treatment with warfarin spontaneous non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma is a rare entity and seen in patients with underlying coagulopathy or warfarin therapy all right so spontaneous non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma is a rare entity and seen in patients with underlying coagulopathy and warfarin therapy warfarin therapy there can be other underlying causes also those other underlying causes can be rupture of cysts a uh, bleed from an angiomyolipoma bleed from a renal carcinoma and also bleed from pseudo aneurysms so other underlying causes are the other underlying causes are rupture of cysts rupture of cysts bleeding from an angiomyolipoma bleeding from an angiomyolipoma renal carcinoma renal carcinoma and pseudo aneurysms and pseudo aneurysms when we talk about basic approach to patients with a traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma we must understand that the story should always begin from history followed by physical examination and then other investigations and treatment decisions all right so the basic approach to patients with traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma patients with traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma should begin with history and physical examination so first we are going to do a history and physical examination of the patient history and physical examination as surgeons we must be aware of the exact mechanism of injury because that will give us an idea whether it is high velocity or low velocity injury so we must know the exact mechanism of injury 
Patients will usually complain of abdominal pain, flank pain or bank pain. Usually complain of abdominal pain, flank pain or back pain. And physical examination should always begin with evaluation of airway, breathing and circulation. So physical examination should always begin with evaluation of airway, breathing and circulation. We should look for certain specific findings like fracture of pelvis. We should look for certain specific findings like fracture of pelvis. which can be unstable so an unstable fracture pelvis and in case of penetrating injury to the back we should suspect renal injury or great vessel injury in case of penetrating injury to the back in case of penetrating injury to the back renal injury must be suspected or injury to underlying great vessels must be suspected there is another sign called as the great turner sign which is nothing but bruising in the flank region great turner sign which is flank bruising this particular sign is not very specific this particular sign is not very specific in case of patients with non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma the basic approach is almost similar so basic approach to patients with non traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma is very similar to traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma that it should start with a history and physical examination but the problem is the signs and symptoms are often very vague that is signs and symptoms are often vague several studies show that the abdominal pain is the most common complaint several studies show that the abdominal pain is the most common complaint patient often presents with history of syncope pallor and dizziness patient often presents with history of syncope pallor and dizziness features of hypovolemia can be present like tachycardia hypotension features of hypovolemia can be present like tachycardia and hypotension pallor may sometimes be present pallor may sometimes be present if the hematoma compresses the femoral nerve it may cause femoral neuropathy if the hematoma compress on the femoral nerve it causes femoral neuropathy 
Now we are going to talk about investigations in case of a retroperitoneal hematoma. Investigations to be done when we suspect a case of retroperitoneal hematoma. The best investigation and the investigation of choice is CECT abdomen contrast enhanced CT scan of abdomen. So CECT scan of the abdomen is good for retroperitoneal hematoma. It has got high sensitivity. It has got high sensitivity for retroperitoneal hematoma. Fast scan which is done for other injuries is not suitable in case of retroperitoneal hematoma it is not very sensitive so fast scan is unreliable in case of retroperitoneal hematoma Apart from imaging, we have to do other investigations like blood workup and other blood investigations for pancreatic injuries. So, apart from imaging, other investigations which are to be done is CBC, renal function test liver function test and coagulation parameters in case we want to rule out any spontaneous retroperitoneal hematomas so coagulation parameters are important when we suspect pancreatic injuries when we suspect pancreatic injuries we should not forget to do serum amylase and serum lipase so serum amylase and serum lipase is important for ruling out pancreatic injury. The basic management protocol of retroperitoneal hematoma the basic management protocol of retroperitoneal hematoma will depend on what kind of injury it is the traumatic or whether it is atraumatic so basic management protocol will depend upon the etiology which is traumatic or atraumatic in case of traumatic we have to see whether it is a penetrating injury or a blunt injury so traumatic can be divided into penetrating injury or A blunt injury if it is a penetrating mode of injury the hematoma is due to direct injury to the tissues or to the vessels penetrating injury is due to direct injury to the tissue or to the blood vessels therefore surgical exploration is required in case of blunt injury we have to find out whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable so hemodynamic stability is taken into account in case of blunt injury and if there is persistent hemodynamic instability after giving IV fluids or blood products if there is persistent hemodynamic instability or if there is expansile pulsatile hematoma or if there is expansile pulsatile hematoma then surgical exploration is 
needed or surgical exploration is indicated. So in case of persistent hemodynamic instability and expansile pulsatile hematoma, surgical exploration is required. In case of atraumatic retroperitoneal hematoma, the management protocol is slightly different. In that case, the first thing we need to do is reversal of coagulopathy. The first thing that we need to do is reversal of coagulopathy. And other supportive measures which has to be given like blood products or IV fluids, tranexamic acid should be given to the patient. Supportive measures should be given to the patient. If anemia is present, blood transfusion is indicated. If anemia is present, blood transfusion is indicated and mostly the atraumatic retroperitoneal hematoma will settle with conservative measures and blood transfusion alone. Mostly, the atraumatic variety will settle with conservative measures and blood transfusion alone. The management of traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma can be done based on which zone the hematoma is present. So we will study the zone based management of traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma. Zone based management of traumatic retroperitoneal hematoma. The steps are, the first we have to do a CECT abdomen. First we need to do a CECT scan. CECT scan is very sensitive for retroperitoneal hematoma and is the investigation of choice. And based on CECT scan we will locate hematomas in various zones. We will locate the hematoma in various zones. This locating the hematoma in zones will guide further treatment. This will guide further treatment. So first let us come to the zone 1 injury. Zone 1 is also called as the centromedial zone. Zone 1 is also called as the centro medial zone and any injury to zone 1 will require surgical exploration so surgical exploration in is done in case of zone 1 injury in case of zone 2 injury or injury to the perirenal zone or injury to the perirenal zone we have to look at hemodynamic stability the first question that we should ask is whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not if the patient is hemodynamically stable if the patient is hemodynamically stable and has a non-expansile hematoma and has a non-expansile hematoma then this patient can be managed conservatively this patient can be managed conservatively if the patient is hemodynamically unstable if the patient is hemodynamically unstable then surgical 
exploration is warranted in surgical exploration is warranted there is a special situation that is if in ct scan we see a contrast extravasation or contrast blush that is on ct scan if we see a contrast extravasation or contrast blush then surgical exploration or angioembolization should be the mode of management then either surgery or angioembolization needs to be done zone 3 injuries are nothing but hematoma present in the pelvic zone hematoma present in the pelvic zone and mostly these are due to unstable pelvic fractures mostly these are due to unstable pelvic fractures in that particular case the management is external fixation pelvic external fixation or sometimes an application of binder can be done application of pelvic binder can be done but the definitive management in zone 3 hematoma is angioembolization the definitive management in zone 3 hematoma is angioembolization it is angioembolization lastly a word on the complications of retroperitoneal hematoma complications of retroperitoneal hematoma are as follows firstly there is infection or sepsis firstly there is infection or sepsis there is a collection which can get infected leading to infection and sepsis there can be anemia due to constant blood loss can be symptomatic anemia exsanguination or bleeding to death exsanguination or bleeding to death and abdominal compartment syndrome due to intra abdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome with that we come to the end of the chapter of retroperitoneal hematoma i really hope that you enjoyed this video I hope you like the video hit the subscribe button and post comments so that we can have a good discussions thank you so much